Bader. And joining me for today's conversation is Anna Schwarzak, the Habitat Education Program Manager. Welcome, Anna. It's good to be here, Will. Since this uh, happy hour is a little different, it's pre-recorded. Um, you're obviously watching this on YouTube. If you do have any questions as Anna and I's conversation unfolds, please put them in the comments. And uh, I monitor that. I get a little reminder uh, sent to me. So we'll be able to get your question answered. I'll send them to Anna. Or if you, uh, for some reason, have a question that pops up, you don't want to throw it in the comments, you can always reach out to your regional rep and uh, they'll get them back over to us. Also, uh, all chapter happy hours are recorded and posted to YouTube, which you know, uh, since you're watching this here, and uh, feel free to check out some of the other ones. We've got the whole catalog of chapter happy hours available for you, and uh, obviously there's some other content on the channel as well for chapter volunteers. Before we dive in, uh, let's learn a little bit more about our guest, Anna. Talk about your past to Pheasants Forever and Quill Forever, what it means to be the Habitat Education Program Manager. Yeah, um, it's taken me, oh, probably a few years to kind of get to this position here. Um, I started out with Pheasants Forever and Quill Forever right out of college. Um, so like a lot of our staff do out of college, we start out as farm bill biologists um, out on the ground. So I was out in Western Kansas in the middle of nowhere. Um, Walmart was an hour away, so I'm sure a lot of the chapters listening in are, you know, we're in a lot of uh, rural areas. Um, and so that's where I started. And from there, um, transferred on to our education and outreach team. And um, I'm now the Habitat Education Program Manager, um, working on all of our programs for all of our chapters and staff. Love it. And uh, like myself, Farm Bill Biologist, uh, I had a closer Walmart, but it's still quite a drive. So, um, so let's dig into this. Um, the organization, at least in my tenure, so since 2014, has really built out some stellar conservation-focused habitat education programs. And I really like that almost all of these have that, that theme, that, that we're, a, I mean, we're a habitat organization, right? That's our calling yeah. card. And, uh, and when we're working with kids, community groups, we want to have that conservation focus, or at least the, at a broad scale. So uh, I really just want to take a deep dive into the programs that you serve. And uh, obviously, this is being reported for our chapter leaders. And um, if I was a youth chair, and I'm sitting here listening to Will and Anna talk on YouTube, um, where do I go? And when we, when, we're, when we get into these programs, just navigate me here. Pretend that I'm the youth chair outreach coordinator of a chapter. How do I get these and get access to some of this information? Then let's just take one off the top. Yep. Um, so the easiest way probably to get there is you can go to either fedsforever or quellforever.org. Um, once you see that, you'll see that top, top tab that has conservation, hunting stories, all of that along the top. Hit that conservation. And then after that, on your left-hand side, it's the first, first one listed under Habitat Education. And from there, that's going to list all of our programs and all of our resources um, right from there. Um, we also have it um, linked into um, your guys' chapter login. So if you forget all of that, when you guys log into your chapter portal, it's also linked through there. It will bring you right to the website. Love it. Right. So two places to access the information we're going to talk about. Uh, live on the website, no login required, which kind of nice. No login required, yes. But <laughs> if you have, happen to be logged in, hanging out in the chapter resource portal, you know, maybe you're doing some other things in there. We got the information there. I imagine it's under the documents tab and uh, you'll be able to find this there. So I'm in, I didn't log in. I just went to the website. Um, I like it. I like it better that way. I love that this information is stored there. So I'm here on the on the homepage, and the top the top program that falls kind of underneath um, your title is our pollinator habitat outreach program, correct? Yep. And you know, I think I uh, became the rep in 2016 here in Minnesota, and at that time, this program was on fire. The chapters were doing it all over the the state upper Midwest, and there's actually somewhere buried in here is a cool little map about all the projects that have 
uh, taking place throughout the country. And I know that they're still going on, but I've seen in my time chapter turnover, new chapters are starting. It seems like, you know, um, we've got a new chapter once a month or more here. And so there could be some new folks listening. Talk about the habitat. Um, pollinator habitat education program, uh, what it is, and then we'll just get down into let's get into the program specifics. Let's get let's get deep on this thing. I love this program. It's um, one of my favorites, and probably I would say one of the most rewarding um, in person for events to do with kids, communities, um, schools, 4 H groups, um, anything you guys can think of. Um, so it was started in. 2013. So it's one of our longer programs for our habitat education programs. Um, and like Will, had, Will said, since then it's grown. Um, obviously, like most of our events the last few years, it's, it's taken a hit. Um, and then with all of our new chapters and new staff, um, it's just kind of time to revamp it up and make sure everybody knows, knows about it. Um, so a quick summary of what, what the heck this program <laughs> even is. Um, it's really a good training tool and resource for chapters to get involved in the local community, um, teach that local community about who Pheasants Forever is, how that is connected to upland habitat, how that's connected to pollinator habitat. And through that, you also do a habitat project as well too. Um, so the standard kind of outline of the project day is you start with some of that education up front, and then you end with everybody outside getting their hands maybe a little bit dirty and, and seeding a site at the end of the day. Yeah, and you know, the, the beauty of this program and, and is that it, it, can, it works anywhere, right? So, you know, you said you started your career in Western Nebraska, mine was Western Minnesota. Now I live in Minneapolis, right? And I've got Metro chapters that have um, completed one of these or many of these to be fair, um, pollinator planting. And, they did so um, through a unique program or a unique partnership because uh, obviously a cha any chapter at any point in time can um, host a pollinator event, right? Yep. They can do so with the money that they raise at their fundraisers, their banquets, and that's totally fine. But we've got resources and financial resources as yep. well to kind of um, combat that a little bit, right? Or, or to sweeten the pot a little. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so... If you look at that fun little map after you click on it, we've hosted these in, I think now 23 different states. Um, so to just show these can be done anywhere. I've been on projects, you know, out in rural, and I've also been in the middle of a city doing these projects as well too. Um, and we actually, in the last, if you're familiar a little bit with the program, we have changed some of the criteria. Um, so there used to be a half acre minimum requirement on there. Um, which we actually took out just because we do have a lot of chapters in the big cities. And sometimes that's hard to get that big of a chunk of land um, to plant. And so we took that requirement out. Um, so as long as we have a good seed mix putting in, it can be smaller projects on schools or parks um, and stuff like that. So we do have a fun little, as we kind of like to call it a carrot on the stick to help chapters get these projects um, in the ground. And so um, each chapter can get a grant for each project. So for example, if a chapter is working on three different projects, you can apply for a grant for each of those. Um, as long as there are different educational days, um, that's perfectly fine with us. As long as we have funding, which we have not run out ever before, and I've been trying to work on getting more partners and stuff. And with that too, um, it's $500 per, um, per project. And that's half of the expenses matched up to 500. So to get that full 500, the chapter spends a thousand and we'll reimburse you $500 back right into your CMS account. Right, so um, chapter leaders at home, again, we're just on the website and we're just pulling information from, from here. We went uh, obviously to the Habitat Education section, Anna mentioned that in the beginning and then we hit pollinator program uh, grant. And in here, there's the map that I mentioned, and then there's the grant information and criteria. That's what you're talking about with the half acre. And I, I mean, to be honest, a half acre around here, that's, that's not easy to come by, right? So I yep. love that 
we made that little tweak with the program and uh, with things sort of improving on a world scale um, as far as, the, as COVID goes and those things, I'm, I'm hoping that these programs come back and uh, well, or just take that step up and return to some normal. Right. So um, I'm just looking through here and it's, it's all laid out. Like we certainly, it's fun to do a chapter happy hour to talk through these things, but <laughs> this is step by step. If you're interested in this, we're going to go through it to some extent, but um, I invite all the chapter leaders uh, listening at home to just check this out. It, it's, it's uh, a, what do we got a four five step process here? Um, program criteria, pretty self-explanatory. These are just sort of every program has sort of certain metrics that you have to, the hit thresholds you need to meet. But um, really this is pretty easy. Um, seed mix must include three species in each bloom period, but you know, the organization and any uh, reputable native seed vendor would have a pollinator mix available, right? Yes. Is yeah. there any criteria that this needs to be purchased through the, the Pheasants Forever Quail Forever Seed Program or can I we use another vendor? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, you certainly can send, there's order forms on here too. You can send it to me if you don't want to have to worry about picking a seed mix um, and you want me to handle it, I will definitely do that for you. Um, and that'll go through our seed program. It'll meet all the qualifications, but you don't have to do that. Um, if you guys have good relationships with the local seed vendor, go for it. Um, there's definitely great benefits on keeping things local and bringing in more partners for these projects as well too. Right. And that, you know, um, I'm happy that we're, we're doing it both ways. One, I, I have a biology background. I still can't, rem I can't remember all the native plants anymore. It would take me forever <laughs> to put a mix together with 30 to 40 species um, at, with at least three in each blooming period. I'm not sure how many blooming periods there are anymore. I've forgotten most of that. And so for <laughs> chapter leaders, some of them might be in on that. But for most, having the availability to either work with you or your local vendor, that's perfect. And again, a lot of these, there's going to be sort of a common theme here, right? We're building community. So this program is an excellent example of that. And then part of that too is working with your local vendor, if you have it, invite them out, right? Yes. Invite them into this sort of event if you've got that as well. But know that Pheasants Forever and Quilt Forever has a seed store available for you too. So um, chapters, front the cost, and then submit some sort of reimbursal. And if it's, you know, obviously if it's a thousand and one dollars or a thousand bucks that you uh, established into this project, we'll send uh, $500 via CMS, I imagine, into the chapter's account, correct? Yep. Yep. That's correct. Perfect. And just doing some quick clicks here, the grant application is all online and fillable, right? So there's, we're not yes. doing carbon copies anymore. We don't have to fill this out with pen and ink and send it through the mail. No. We just go right through the website. Yep, that's right. So, I mean, I would be lying if I'm saying all of them coming in are through the website. There's still some some carbon copies floating around out there, but let me tell you, it makes your life a lot easier if you guys don't have to mail me or scan me in a form. Um, just click that online application. It's super simple. Um, we try to make this stuff easy. Um, and that'll just, it'll go right to me and I'll send you an email confirmation once I've kind of looked through and made sure that it looks like it meets the, the criteria. Love it. And, you know, um, just another thing I'm, I'm thinking about too is I would say, you know, and I, I guess you would know, but historically or traditionally, these would be youth focused or, um, school focus. Is yep. that, is that out of line to say? Nope. Um, probably I would say 90% of the applications I come through, they're partnering with a local school group or a 4-H group. Um, so they're either going to be on school grounds or we do see a lot of these projects um, out on wildlife management areas. Um, and that seems to work really good as well too, because if you can contact whoever is managing that area, a lot of times they can help with site prep um and items like that as well too to get the area set up yeah so that so that leads me to a couple more questions 90 percent of them come through schools or historically or 4-H groups but as long as you're engaging with a community group yep. any community group there and you know you've met the criteria you've established a location you can find it i mean all the checks that we have to we have to hit that are right here on the site for you you're okay though. I mean, this can be, yeah. a this could be just, it, oh, yeah. this could be a, like a, 
uh, maybe not like a single family, but like, you know, a, a neighborhood organization, mm-hmm. a homeowners association, something like that, where you're having uh, a Habitat Education Day or morning, right, with any sort of community group that you've got. I'm just, I'm just trying to, you know, think outside the box a little bit. Yeah. We're always trying to open our umbrella here at the organization. We can, we can really open it up um, through this program, correct? Yep. Yeah, that's... Um... Any of it counts, as long as there's kind of new people there to learn about our organization, which obviously chapters, we, we'd love to do that. It's You can help recruit more people into your chapter, too. These, these sort of events can bring in new people from the community who might not necessarily be interested in, in Pheasants Forever. They might think of us more of the hunting organization. So sometimes these Habitat events can bring in more people um, and help us share our message uh, in a different way that we probably wouldn't have reached them before. So even if it's a public day and you don't even have a set specific group, um, that works as well too. I love that. And national night out, like those kind of things. I'm thinking yep. about that as well. And that's a big around here for sure. And I, I do want to touch on this. You know, you mentioned that some of these happen or partake on wildlife management areas. You did touch on the fact that you want to work with your local wildlife manager, but just want to reiterate if, this public land, you know, obviously that's uh, open to the not open to the public there to uh, stumble over my words, but you definitely want to reach out to your resource professional, the manager of that property, or just go to them in general, build that relationship and say, hey, we have an interest in doing one of these. Do you have a site in mind? And, you know, they can lead you to a perfect site or Maria, a handful of sites where you're actually doing physical work on WMAs, but it's not, you know, you don't want to bring your rototiller to the neighborhood WMA and start <laughs> ripping it off, right? That, that's yep. what we're trying to do. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and a lot of times we've had projects like that where they're working with that local manager um, and you're kind of able to set up almost like an outdoor classroom too and get some really cool signage put out. Um, so when it's on public property, you don't know who's going to be, you know, walking through and, and enjoying the land that we can all go on. Um, right. And so having a lot of that signage um, there with all of our PF logos and educational signs um, is, is pretty cool to see long-term on these sites. And, and uh, not to belabor the point, but you're, you're just hitting all these words that are triggering more and more questions for me. You, you, like you talked about an educational sign or educational field day. Uh, there's an educational component to this, right? Yes. Obviously, you know, we want to create wildlife habitat. In any way we can get our communities, our youth, whomever outdoors is a win you know bringing new people to into our chapters we love that for an organization but if for the, at least for the grant specifically and honestly because it's the right thing to do we need some type of education activity that goes on so dance around a couple of those topics and i know you likely have some resources available you know our chapters aren't full of uh, high school teachers elementary school teachers yep. sunday school teachers some of them are but a lot of them, like myself, um, get scared when you got a bunch of kids that are staring up at you. I wouldn't know what to do. So help me uh, learn a little bit more about like, what's that education side of this grant look like and these projects look like? Yeah, um, so we just require at least one educational activity. Um, and once we get, I know we're gonna touch um, later on too on our resource page, but as simple and turnkey as we've made and tried to lay out this program, we've done the same thing with our educational resources and choosing activities that are easy to do. If, if you don't have a biology background, if you don't have a teaching background, I want you to be able to pick up these activities and be able to do those with confidence. Um, and so just a couple examples, we even have, we have an intro talk um, all on the resource page. You can print it front and back. So it has literally has the talking points on the back for you to each of those pages. Um, So it'll help you kind of flow through that. That talks about who we are as an organization and how that's connected to pollinator habitat. Um, And then another game that probably most of the projects that I go on, I always bring it with me. Um, We have a pollinator free food game. That's really easy to do. It's, I will run this through kids or adults. Um, It might seem a little silly for adults to do, um, but essentially one of them, for example, is ice cream sundae. So it has all of the ingredients that you would potentially put on an ice cream sundae. And you talk about, hey, what food ingredients, if the pollinators are declining, what are we going to lose? And what would you have left in your ice cream sundae bowl? Um, and you're left with nothing. 
at the end, which, you know, kids are pretty connected to their ice cream. I really like my ice cream. Uh, and so it's kind of a big, a big shock to run that, run that through. I mean, most people don't, you can, can kind of hear some of the stats. It's, you know, one in every three bites of food is affected by pollinators. Um, but when you actually see how that affects the food that, that you eat, you know, probably on a weekly or monthly basis, it, it hits home pretty easily. Uh, that, I mean, you piqued my interest in ice cream Sunday. So now I'm all bought in, but I do think that that's critical. You know, we, you read the headlines, you read the articles, I mean, it's everywhere. Um, but to uh, put it into something that we all love, yep. <laughs> making it that simple, uh, I think is, uh, is such an intuitive way to showcase how important pollinators are to our livelihood, right? And uh, look, these are just um, things you can do in your local community that are going to have a huge benefit. Um, and, uh, you know, it's simply certainly worth taking the time to share with our chapter leaders um, that are listening at home. So I want to round this out because, you know, uh, there's, we've talked about like, you know, there, we've got the resources, the grants, the education components, the criteria, but it's a grant, you know, uh, yeah. we've got, we've got, a, it says it's forever and quail forever. We've got a back end of that as well, but I'm guessing it's probably pretty easy to tie out the funding and to uh, capture the data or, you know, capture the event, right? So what does the back end of that look like? So after the event, everyone's gone home, everything's, you know, in the ground, the Sundays are cleaned up and, um, you know, the youth care outreach chairs at home is like, well, now what do I do? Um, so talk a little bit about that. Yep. Um, and there is a grant checklist as well, too. Um, when you look at that program criteria, um, under step one, there's a grant checklist. So it's one page. That way, if, if that's how your brain works and you want a checklist to be able to click through so you don't forget anything on the front end or back end, it's all right there. Um, so it, it lists out what you need to do before your event and after your event. Um, main things before your event, obviously your application, um, our insurance form, which you should all be familiar with. Um, we do have a different insurance form for non-firearm events. Um, it's simpler um, and it includes our photo release in there as well too. Um, and then it just kind of talks about, hey, make sure you order your seed, um, any merchandise, your site prep, just get prepared for the event. Um, and then after your event, I need an um, online event form. So any event that chapters are doing, we should be reporting that event. Um, so you don't have to send anything specifically for me as long as you go ahead and report that. Um, those come through my email automatically. So you don't have to send anything separately. Um, report the event like you always do. Um, and then you'll send me all of your receipts for the event. So anything um, associated event counts. So if you have to pay for busing people, um, if you have to pay for getting a porta potty out on the event site, mm -hmm. right? Like everything for that event counts, food for the event, um, all of the site prep, the seed, that all counts um, to count or to, to go towards that event. Um, so I need receipts, a volunteer hour log, and then um, optional, but always appreciated is photos of the event and to forward to me if you had um, any newspaper articles um, or anything like that that kind of highlights your event and the partners that go along with it as well too. Um, so that stuff helps me. Um, this, these grant funds come from our partners um, and so I like to share those with them and that just kind of helps bring in bring in more money into the organization and I can keep providing these grants to give back to chapters. 100%. And, you know, any good chapter happy hour host would have clicked on the grant checklist already and had that prepared. I'm just happy you went through it for me. But <laughs> I mean, we're talking about nine bullets here, two of which are, you know, optional, but encouraged. Yeah. Um, yep. So really super simple. Throw these things on Event Center as well. You know, I mean, let, let that service uh, market to you, your network. Um, and then, yeah, you know, We've talked, anyone that's listened to these happy hours over the last six or seven months, I think we've made the case for reporting. And, um, you know, it's, it's not the most fun thing, but, you know, if you've got 10, 11 people there, this isn't, this isn't super hard, but it is really important to our uh, funders. And, you know, I, um, we've had a, 
18 months of pretty challenging scenarios to do these events, but we were still, I believe, able to um, impact like 40,000 people through our education outreach program the last year. And so one, those numbers are really fun to bring to funding partners, I'm sure for you, but oh, yeah. two, you say a number like that, or I know we've been in the six figures in years past, correct? That's, that's what you want to say at your banquet, you know, for the folks that might just engage with your chapter one time out of the year. And we hope that, you know, we're, we're moving to more year round activity as a chapter and be more relevant in your community. But let's be honest, we're just getting back to banquets. And so if you can say these numbers, like how many individuals were impacting young and old, that's powerful. And that's powerful. And, you know, if you're trying to raise money or make a case for your chapter, um, rolling all those numbers up or e even just keeping track of the numbers yourself more so than the dollars spent. You know, people love hearing about people and how you're impacting the community. Dollars are fun, but people are important. And so keeping track of that, and we've made reporting so much easier now. Um, so I hope uh, the folks are jumping in on that. And then I do want to touch on tell your story, right? And like, uh, it's so easy nowadays. We've got Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, your local newspaper is still a great resource, but yep. you know, take the pictures, uh, take that beautiful picture at the end with everybody there in their orange shirts, you know, in front of the sign or whatever it is and share it. You never know who you're going to reach through the, you know, a local resource like your, your newspaper or, or through social media. I mean, we're, like I said, we're, we're trying to open the umbrella of the organization and these, this program and the ones we're going to touch on here are great ways to do it. So please, please consider that as well. But. And once you have those, I mean, you have those photos of these events. Um, I know some of like my local chapters around here, they then use that at their banquet to show, I mean, some of those people are just going to be, they show up for the banquet. They, they really love going there and um, but it's a perfect place to show them, Hey, look at all of these other events and look at all of these other kids and people in the community that, you know, that we've worked with throughout the year besides this, this one night banquet. Right. Throw up, put a slideshow together and run yep. it during the banquet. Right. And, and just taking pictures. It's, it's a, it's powerful stuff. So you've got, there's a step five here and it seems like a bit of an extension, but you know, we've got some chapters full of, um, ex resource professionals, retired biologists like that may want to take this another step further. And obviously, you know, when you plan any kind of new prairie, the first couple yep. of years are a little tough and then all of a sudden the magic happens. Right. And so um, is the citizen science, is the monitoring, is that still part of this? Obviously your the grant would be closed out at this point in time, but if they want to maybe continue that education opportunity through the monitoring, you know, do chapters just kind of do it on their own or are these still part of the process here? Um, this is completely optional, um, but we just have it linked there um, in case they want to do it. Um, like, I mean, we'll set it perfectly, right? These first one, two years, um, I always try to bring that up on trainings. We love to show these beautiful photos um, of these well-established prairies. It will not look like that year one, two. Um, year three, four, yeah, that's when it, you're going to start seeing that um, but these are just a couple different option of monitoring activities. Um, these are great to share with if you're working like with teachers um, or if the, the groups want to come together and visit those sites in year two, three, get them back out there on the site that they planted. Um, we have, I mean, a project locally here that we um, we take the kids back out on the site that they planted and we do uh, monarch tagging later on in the fall. So they're able to look out and see what they planted earlier. It's an annual project. So we have past projects that are established. Um, and so just kind of having that connection of, hey, I didn't just throw some seed in the dirt and then walked away, right? Like they can, they look out and they'll make comments like, oh, like I planted this. Mm -hmm. And then they can go and tag monarchs or they can go see the butterflies and do monitoring activities and see the impact that they've made themselves. Um, so it's pretty cool to see the kids get, you know, they're, they're proud and they yeah. should be, it's pretty cool. No, I love it. I mean, in reality, these can be education, like outdoor classrooms or certainly a place where if, especially if it's in schools or community areas, like they can revisit this once a year or even more times, just like yeah. this is part of our community now. And that's a powerful thing that a chapter can kind of hang their hat on. Um, and it is good 
to let the fight you're working with, you know, a public works department or a school to let them know like, yes. hey, this is native prairie, right? This isn't mom's petunia garden or something. Yeah. Um, this is going to take a while, but the benefit will certainly out, outweigh what it's going to look like the first couple. And you might get a nice flush of natives the first couple of years, but for sure, yep. two, three, four and beyond. <laughs> yeah, there's there's always annuals in the mix and we hope that those are going to be up in that, you know, in those first year or two to help, you know, make it still look pretty. But it is good to have that education um, on the front end just so they aren't expecting expecting to look at a year three prairie when it's a year one prairie. Yep, love it. There's um, That was about as deep dive as I've ever gone into that. And I, I hope that was valuable for our chapter. I mean, these are not hard. Um, they take time and it's a really impactful program, and I'd encourage all the chapters, honestly, all of you, um, to, to consider doing this. And, you know, depending on the communities in which you live, you may be able to do something like this every year. And, um, you know, it's important to have that banquet, but we should be working towards engaging with your community and different people within your community all year round, or at least a couple of times a year, more so than just that spring or fall banquet. So this is a, a perfect opportunity for that. And um, I think that ties a bow on the pollinator program, but you've got some others that you're working with, specifically milkweed in the classroom, which I wanna get to next. This thing took off in Minnesota um, this year. And I know, I think you probably saw a bump across the country. So yes. I know I can remember back, it's just hard to believe, but. <laughs> we did, we had a really amazing science teacher uh, in my elementary school. We had a whole monarch, um, like, curriculum, you know, and I think that's pretty common within, um, but it's been a while since I've been in elementary school. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy the organization's got something like this put together, but uh, for chapters that aren't aware, let's do a deep dive into this milkweed in the classroom program because it was clearly um, a popular one this year. Yep. Um, yeah, we saw, I mean, just to kind of give a little bit of a visual, we had, um, I think, 12 when we piloted it in the first year. The second year, we went um, and we offered it to a few states out of there and I think got around 30. Um, and then this year, um, we were able to get 107. So that just really shows looking at it big picture on, I mean, how much it took off. Um it can be really involved from a chapter standpoint or really hands off um, besides helping fund it. And I think that that definitely helps. So if, if a chapter is, you know, they just kind of want to help the local teacher out, um, great. But they can also do habitat projects on the back end of these as well, too, um, and make it events with the chapters and get more involved with that local teacher. That's incredible. 30 to 107. I mean, yeah. that's, that's so talk about what it is, you, you know, and I, I've got some chapters uh, that are likely going to be tuning into this that have participated in this program. But for those that haven't, it's it, we just we provide kits. Is that like for school teachers or schools? But then, yep. you know, so touch on that and then let's let's dig into like the where the chapter can be a little bit more involved here after a little bit. Yeah. So the, it's called Milkweed in the Classroom Kit. So within that. Um, it's everything a teacher needs to grow, if you could guess, milkweed in the classroom, right? <laughs> um, but so that includes um, the seed starting trays, the containers, the seed, the soil, the grow lights, um, a timer that is connected to those lights so you don't have to worry about turning it on and off <laughs> every day, um, and a spray bottle as well, too. Um, and then the teachers also get um, a printed out copy of just how to start growing that seed along with curriculum that they can use in the classroom. Um, and then they get a bunch of online resources to help them um, teach that curriculum um, and, and go through the year. So these kits, just to kind of pair up with growing season, they ship out um, normally mid to late January. Um, the teachers will will get those and start the kits growing. That way, the milkweed will be ready to plant by the end of the school year. Um, and so, uh, those teachers are instructed, and and with the we always connect them to the local chapters as well too, and hope that um, they can either make a project on the side of the school so those kids can go and plant the milkweed, 
um, right there at the school. Um, or if they have somewhere close that they want to do, you know, a habitat education day, they can go use those milkweed plugs to go plant them on that as well, too. Love it. Love it. And I'm just here again, just hanging out on the website and it's all there. I mean, um, you, you've got just obviously totals of what we've done, but then the additional resource section is, is, is awesome. There's all kinds of curriculum guides and information there. And obviously the partners that have um, jumped in to help this, but so what's the, um, what's the cost to a chapter and like, how do, how do we, how do we, obviously you facilitate the program, but you know, again, um, I'm a new chapter. I'm, I'm either the treasurer that's got an, uh, yep. you know, an interest in this or I'm the youth chair, outreach chair. Like, what do we do on here? Yep. Um, so we open up the application starting in September. Um, and those are opened up September 1st through the end of November. Um, and then right when you send in that application, I'll let you know, hey, you're good to go. Um, and, you know, letting you know that your teachers will, will get those kits then in January. Um, so if you're interested now, you can still email me. My email's on the website right there. And I can get you on a list to send you a reminder, right? Because September is a little ways away right now. And, you know, that's also the start of hunting season in a lot of areas. So just being realistic, sometimes that email reminder is yeah. quite nice. Yeah. Um, so just send me an email. I have a list going. Um, so I'll let you know when this opens up again. Um, the full price of the kit, if we do not have grant funding, is $500. So that covers the cost of the kit along with, which I forgot to mention when I was explaining everything that's included, um, youth memberships to all the, the students and the teacher. Love it. Um, so they will get um, a youth membership at Presence Forever, Quill Forever, depending on what area that you're in. Um, but we are, we've gotten funding. funding. Um, got it for this year, we did run out. Um, and so we did have a few chapters pay full price. Um, so if you are interested when that opens up, I highly recommend you get it in fast because if it keeps growing like it did this year, it's, it's likely we could run out of more funding again, but we do have more funding. So we will have grant funding available again. Um, and that takes the cost down to 250. Right. So you're paying for half the price of the kit. Yeah. Um, Either way, from, that. I mean, that's about as good of a use of chapter dollars as I can think, right? This is your yes. local community. These are your school children, like the school kids. And this is conservation, right? So this is, this checks every single box that we've got as far as mission delivery goes, so. Yep. Um, and then I lost my. I my know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Again, if you had a good chapter happy hour host, then this wouldn't happen, but that's, that's all right. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, what, it, like, you know, um, something that maybe chapters aren't thinking about is, you know, engaging with the local school, you know, I think chapters should obviously open up and build a relationship with, you know, your local educators, be it science, or if you've got, or we had a, uh, I think we had a wildlife management, it was like part of the ag department when I went to school. So obviously you want to build relationships there, but, you know, if, You've got a frequently asked questions page here, which touches on this, but if, if they're not in front of a computer, well, they're on YouTube, so they are. But yes. what age are we gearing this toward? Is there a, you know, is there that someone is it too young or too old? Like, where should they be focusing on if this is something that interests a chapter? Great question. So if they're reaching out um, to a school district and so it's kind of open um, they can kind of say hey I want I want your teacher contact information for x grade um, the curriculum that we developed is specifically for grades third through fifth um, and that's because our um, lesson plans specifically align up with the stem requirements that the teachers have to follow um, and that was kind of the best fit for that um, that being said, we do have some other partners that have shared their curriculum with us um, that will meet, you know, grades six through eight. We have another one that's K through 12. So if it's outside of that, you can certainly still use it. Um, but that's kind of where it fits best is that third through fifth grade. Love it. So just to tie a bow on it, um, 500 bucks, unless we find some funding. And um, 
you were successful in that, but we were overbooked with kits, which is the best problem in the world yep. to have. Um, if this is something that you guys want to jump in on right now, Anna's email is right there on the website. Otherwise, I'm going to put it in the link in the description. Um, send her an email now. She's building a list for all you prairie grouse hunters that forget that things happen in the fall. And this yes. is totally me. Um, yep. As soon as September hits, I'm, it's really hard for me to think about uh, really anything other than flying birds and my dogs are being very loud behind me. Um, send Anna an email. She'll get you on a list. You'll get that email in September and the kits will show up January of 2023, which seems like a fake year, but is really just one year away, right? It's, yeah, crazy. Um, and if you guys have teachers, like right now, um, I can't get them a kit. They've already shipped out and it's too late, but the curriculum's free. Um, which is sometimes hard for teachers to find curriculum that's free that they don't have to pay for. Um, and so it's free to download right off the website. So if you already have that teacher connection and they just want some good curriculum to include in that talks about conservation and talks about prairie, um, it's right there. You can go and, and send that to them, no problem. They can implement that today. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Um, let's, Let's double this again. I mean, we went from 30 to 100 and whatever, seven. So let's, I mean, we've got 700 plus chapters. So we likely all have a school district in our area or one um, nearby. So um, make those relationships and those inroads with the chat, with the, your local school districts. We're getting them a membership. I mean, your uh, local school's library should have a member membership anyway, right? So yes. sponsor that. Let's get the journal in these libraries, add a membership to your, um, chapter roster and, you know, see what we can pull out of there. But then also, I mean, think of the kids that are being impacted with this and to get them a ringneck um, uh, membership or youth membership is so important. So love it. Another one. And it's, it's, I mean, just to kind of share a story to, to show how impactful these programs are. Milk me in the classroom, Paul and I have that outreach program. Um, I mean, I had a teacher, I probably shouldn't share the story, but I'm going to. I had a teacher the chat email right me, email me a couple of weeks ago. They had received their kit, um, asked to go through a cold stratification period that milkweed seed does. So we list that out. It has to be either in a freezer or outside for a couple of weeks, go through the freeze thaw. So it breaks dormancy. So when you bring it back inside, it'll start growing. Um, but she had it outside for a couple of weeks and nothing's growing and she was concerned. Um, and so, you know, I was kind of was like, it was a shocking moment, honestly, a little bit for me. I'm like this, the teacher probably had never grown anything before yeah, and had then probably told the kids, hey, we're going to put this outside and, you know, probably 20, 30 degree weather, milkweed's going to grow, right? So it, it's a great educational tool, not only for the students, but it's obviously making an impact on the teachers <laughs> as well, too. <laughs> we're all learning. That's what's important. All right. learning, right? And so, I mean, and this is, this is in the Midwest, right? I mean, you can't tell me that I bet there's probably more teachers and more students out there than, than we are well aware of that one probably have no idea what a pheasant is, what a quail is, right? Bet they probably couldn't even pick one of those out. Um, and so this stuff makes, makes big impacts. They're probably not gonna see that unless they go through one of these programs. Uh, well said. I, I mean, two just stellar um, opportunities for chapters to to you know, dig into their local communities and build in roads there. So I love it. Anna, you are frozen, and you're almost back. This is totally normal. Don't worry. And you're back. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Um, so we should mention I live in kind of middle of nowhere, Nebraska now, and internet's, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm not by a big city, so. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't worry. People are used to that. We're uh, there's no issues there. Um, that was a good time for them to get another beverage or something. But um, we've got a couple more. So I mean, you've got some great programs that we're going to touch on here. But I would say that those are the two big pillars, right? Of, yes. Specifically, when you're talking about youth or classroom or you know those kind, which is obviously the title of this happy hour. But you've got. Um, clays for conservation. That's a, something we'll touch on. We got take habitat home miles for monarchs. And then we'll dig into the resources tab, but just spend a few moments of your time. Uh, clays for conservation. This is, 
for those of you that listened to my conversation with Aaron Keel, which was pre-recorded as well on YouTube, he mentioned this, and he would have because that was our seed program conversation. Yeah. These are facilitated out of our uh, through our seed program, but it's it's like the coolest thing that I can think of um, as far as you know if you're working with a trap team, and then like let's get them to do a habitat project. You know, kids are busy, but if you have the opportunity, obviously supporting chat or trap teams is great, but we want to connect them more so than just pulling the trigger. Let's get them out in the field or do some type of habitat program with them. And then in the afternoon, let's, let's get these set up and have a little fun. So uh, I'm just dancing around the topic, but talk about yep. these, this program here, this kit that's available. Kit. Yep. So um, this kit comes with um, everything you need. You'll need to purchase the clays, but it comes with all of the seed um, and the powder that's in there. Um, so when you guys visit the website, you'll see a picture. Um, you've probably seen some other events where people do this as well, too, where they, they have some fine powder um, put on the clays. So when you if you're a better shot than, than I am and, and you hit that clay, you can kind of see that the powder and the seeds that are in there for these um, explode. And so it comes with all of that. It comes with the stickers to put on top of on top of the clays um, and it comes with enough to fill 90 of them. Um, so it's just a fun hands-on activity that you can use at events or have your trap team go and use. Um, if you have a spot site prepped, right, and you want to have the trap team do that project, you could shoot these over it. Um, you still need to seed it. I'm not going to say that these are going to actually seed yeah. this. So I want to make that note here, right? Um, it's realistically not going to just go and seed a whole site by just shooting these clays over it. Um, but it's a fun hands-on activity and visual to have, have some fun with. Right. It's fun. Great Plains drills and Truex drills are not, they're not going to, we're not going to put them out of the business with this program. Right? No, we're not going to no. shoot our way to a, a beautiful prairie. They're not shaken because of this, but it's fun. It's something to do. There's, you know, there's, there's feed in there and obviously something can happen, but yeah, you definitely want to feed over this, but it's just, it's a, it's something we've got available to have a little fun, maybe after an event or in the afternoon, you know, after lunch or, sometime during the trap season. So that's available and that information is there as well. Um, Take Habitat Home is another one that's been around for quite a while. I've got some yeah. chapters that utilize this. Um, again, it's more of a kit, but you know, uh, if chapters are really focused on wildlife habitat and we've got banquets um, and you, you know, you wanna send um, this in with the youth bag, right? Or the goodie bag, or if you do mm -hmm. door prize, like, he put it on all the tables so just spend a little time explaining what take habitat home is and uh, maybe some benefits of it or uses of it out, outside of maybe what I just mentioned yeah um so this is um brochure size trifold um and has all of our logos on there talks about who we are talks about pollinator habitat and in the middle of this brochure is a seed packet um, and that has, I believe it's 10 to 12 different wildflower species, good for the Midwest mostly. Um, and that'll seed a 10 by 10 area. Um, so I've seen chapters use these as, you know, placemats, put them on all the, on all the tables at banquets. I've seen chapters use them, um, to raffle off items like you would, you know, hats or koozies and stuff like that. They will use to take Habitat home brochures. It's like a raffle ticket to add on something there. Um, or even at educational events. Um, so say you do a pollinator habitat project, not to keep hitting on that door, but the great Nebraska internet. <laughs> did it pause again? It did, but the, you, you were at pollinator habitat and then, and then it was, then you were an ice sculpture. So talk, just keep it going. If you want to bring All it right. to the pollinator program or pollinator event, Yep. Add this in, right? Yes, yeah, add this in. Um, and those kids can take those home and plant something, you know, at home and, and their, you know, garden by their house. It yeah. plants 10 by 10 areas. So as long as it's it's site prepped, um, there's some annuals in there for stuff to come up in the first year as well, too. Sweet. Um, last one listed on the website. And then just want to jump into the resources tab really quick. Miles from Monarchs. Um, this is a little different, I think, but still something that we've got available. So, so explain what that is. 
I'm not a runner personally, but we might have some uh, folks listening at home where this could be impactful for them. Yes. And full disclosure, I am not, not a runner in the slightest as well. <laughs> I would rather put a 50 pound pack on my back and walk up a hill than I would go run. <laughs> um, so it's called Miles for Monarchs. Um, we started this program with Monarch Joint Venture. Um, and since then, they've kind of taken it over, um, but we still partner with them. Chapters can still use the program. So anything from hosting your own, if you want to do a 5K event um, or use it as a fundraiser event, you can. Um, you'll reach out to, to Monarch Drum Venture and they'll help you set it up. They have the whole platform there um, for registration for, and it's all looks like, a, you know, a, an event running platform for you. Um, and to host an event like that, you could also do um, just more of a activity event where yeah. people are more walking and they are just vi visiting stations as well, too. And you can use it that way, not, um, not just specifically for runners, but you can definitely use it as that as well and, and do a fundraising event with it. It's available. If, if this piques your interest, go for it. I've had chapters inquire about doing 5Ks in the past. I know. Some of them have across the country and, you know, you could tie this in nicely. So uh, it's on the, the Habitat Education tab. And, um, you know, if, if it's something you're interested in, it's there. The links are all there. The partners are there. Um, and if you have any, you know, need any more information, like I said, Anna's email is going to be in the link in the description and you can always reach out to your regional rep. So um, let's move into the grand finale here. Um, it, it's incredible how many resources your team and the greater education outreach team as a whole have put in um, to this website, but that have made available to our chapters. And one of the, one of the main questions I get, I get as it pertains to like this side of the organization is, you know, how do I do one of these or where do I get the curriculum or what can I, you know, we're not educators by trade or yep. some of them might be but not at scale right everything is here <laughs> like you can yes. like you can you can spend 45 minutes listening to us talk and then go to this part of the website and you're you're done you got it you can become an educator and pollinator i mean it's all so let's i don't you know we've got coloring pages i have a <laughs> really anxious dog behind me that needs to go to the dog park but let's get let's get through these i mean here we've got your hands-on educational activities pie or pizza i mean is this what you were talking about for your yes. the the sunday you know yep. that started our conversation is that all here just yep. go through a little bit of this curriculum and then i really just need to encourage chapter leaders to go visit this this part of the website so it, there is so much here and we have more stuff, honestly, in the works, like stuff's going to be added throughout the year. Um, so just feel free to keep visiting it. Don't just download one thing and never visit it again, because there will be updates and there's going to be more resources added onto it. Um, starting up, we have, there's pre-event forums. So if you want to send in a seed order form, the volunteer insurance is on there. Um, that intro talk I talked about, where if you have no idea what the heck to say to these kids, how do I connect pollinator habitat to PF? The intro talk is there. Um, download it, print it off front and back. Talking points are there for you. Um, we have habitat establishment guides. So if you want help on how to convert something to pollinator habitat, we have the guides up there for you. Um, we have templated letters to school leaders and educators as well too. So if you're trying That's to start huge. one of these products, yeah. you have no idea, you know, how to reach out to these teachers. Um, these are actually written by a school teacher. So it kind of helps. They kind of wrote it in their language to help reach out to them. It's there for you to download and, and alter for you to reach out. Um, going down is curriculum. Um, so this has partners that have agreed to share curriculum for free, um, along with our milk and the curriculums on there too, to download um, our partner logos are on there. So we haven't hit too much on this, but um, those are on there. So you can download and use if you're doing um, a pollinator habitat outreach program, it's required to have a sign. We didn't kind of skipped over that part earlier, but it is required to have a sign with our partner logos on there. So 
they're up there to Pretty download fair. if you go through a local sign vendor. Um, and then hands-on educational activities. We have our pollinator free ice cream sundae. There's also a sandwich one, taco one, pizza one. It's, so many. There's so much. I'm like out <laughs> so of breath. We, don't need to, they can, we can all go to a website. <laughs> what I'm trying to get across is we have templated letters to reach out to educators. We've got yep. all the curriculum necessary. The educational game. I mean, look, um, it's, there's no doubt, like most of our chapter volunteers, this isn't their, this isn't their, their volunteers, right? This isn't their job, their full-time job, like yep. myself and, and, and you. But we're trying our best to make this as easy as possible because doing this kind of work matters right? It's the mission of the organization to do that. And, you know, I, our last conversation was um, Marissa and Renee talking about mm -hmm. women on the wing. And I made the point, you know, and I, I just need to reiterate, there are a lot of people in this organization whose sole role is to create programs and make it easier for you, the chapter leader, to deliver mission. And Anna, is an amazing example of that. And these programs and everything that has been put here is an amazing example of that. And like, we didn't even get, well, we, yeah, we've got the graphics and fact sheets, yeah. but it's here. And if it's not here, another person that, you know, directly available to help you succeed is your regional representative. So definitely reach out to them as well. I do want to touch, it's so important, like, Partnership is, if you could fit partnership into the mission of the organization, like it, it's got to be there. Everything we do um, is because of a partnership of some sort, right? No one's doing one thing alone. So I do want to take a second or two. Partners play a huge role in the programs that you facilitate. So hit on that, where they come from. Now you can see Mojo in the background really looking out the window. So disregard him. <laughs> Touch on the partners, and then let's let's tie a bow on the longest happy hour I've ever had, and it's just been the best. There's so much information we went through. I love so. And touch I on still your have one more thing I have to share because oh, we didn't dude. talk about the educational flyers. But let me grab this without making up my headphones. So we have educational flyers and graphics on there, and the flyers can be printed front and back. They have activities on the back, but Another really cool way, I just have to share this, is you can print these out as signs, right? And they look freaking awesome, yeah. okay? So I have a couple of them. They'll be at Pheasant Fest. So if any chapters are going to Pheasant Fest, um, these print out phenomenal as signs. So if you have that project, that's gonna be an outdoor classroom um, or it's on public ground where, you know, general public's gonna be walking by. Those are already made up. You don't have to create anything else. Just send them to your local sign vendor and, and use the front page um, as a sign there for people to walk by. There's a bunch of cool stuff on there and the graphics look, look pretty And, and they'll just print out, like you said. So it's, yep. it's, it's not going to be blurry. It's not going to, you know, nope. sometimes that happens. They're set up for that. Again, yes. just a well thought out, <laughs> just a well thought out uh, little part of, of any kind of activity that we're doing here. I love that. So on to partners. Um, I would say, I mean, I, we've said this so many times, it's volunteers for one in our chapters are the biggest thing. I, I could not bring in the partners that we have on here if we did not have the vol volunteers and the chapters who are willing to do these programs, right, and who contribute to NCLI. Um, those things go away and none of this is available. Yeah. Um, so it's there because of you guys. Um, honestly, like we can't, we can't say it enough. Um, and because of those contributions and because of these events being held, um, I'm able to bring in some really amazing partners. Most of these have been, um, around for, I mean, four or five years now and have given annually. Um, and with that, that's what helps give me these, these grant funds that we can then give back to chapters as well too and make it easier for you to do events. Um, it helps fund all of these resources that we have made yeah. um, as well too. And that's just such a, uh, a great point and something I, I neglected to, to talk about as well. I'm so happy you brought that up. It's like, we've touched on this in some other happy hours, but that NCLI contribution doesn't, it just doesn't go into a black hole, 
right? Like it goes, it goes to amazing staff like Anna, who then brings that coupled with all of those people that we're impacting, right? We bring yeah. our dollar, your dollar, the chapter leader's dollar, all of the people that are running through your programs that you're, that you're reaching out to and meeting and impacting. And we bring that to people like Bayer, Monarch Joint Venture, Cabela's Outdoor Heritage, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Portiva, Pollinator Partnership, anybody. We bring that there. And, you know, I've been, I said this in the last half hour as well, I've been lucky enough to sit in on some of these meetings as well. And it's just, blows those folks over the moon like it just the smiles on their face of how can we help how can we help and honestly they're helping they created helped create um some of the most impactful programs we have at the organization and we're making a difference in the community especially with some of our younger members the future of conservation as i always say at banquets you know we bring the youth up so i love that and um i think we're on a path to do more so I want to thank you for joining me. It's been like an hour and five minutes. I, I've it never went by fast. This long. <laughs> it went by way fast. And uh, it was such a good conversation. But Mojo needs to go to the dog park. So we're <laughs> going to go now. And uh, I appreciate all you listening at home. This will be on YouTube and encourage your chapter leaders and others um, to, to jump on and watch some of these. Anna, thank you for your time. It's been just a dream. Thanks, Will. See ya.